in an effort to uh, support economic activity when it needs support. Um, and we, we supervise and regulate banks. We operate large parts of the payment system. So we have a lot of different uh, roles. All of them are, are meant to be undertaken in a strictly non-political way that serves all Americans. Uh, uh, the last thing I'll say is that uh, we do have this precious grant of independence as all central banks and major uh, advanced economies do. But with that comes the obligation of transparency and accountability. So we are directly accountable in our system of government to the oversight committees that we report to in Congress. And we work very hard to keep their trust, to understand what's on their minds, to explain what we're doing uh, as, as uh, you know, a way for us to maintain our de democratic legitimacy uh, in a system where, where most of the authority is vested as it should be in elected people, not in appointed people like us. As a somewhat real specific follow-up to that, do you worry either generically or especially these days when so much is going on, that the public, the markets, the Congress, the White House, take your pick, hold exaggerated beliefs about what the Federal Reserve can actually accomplish? You know, mission creep is one thing, and you've been asked to creep your mission for sure. Uh, giving a mission <clears throat> possible is something rather different. So what do you think, think about that? You know, I, I think we, we do have this precious grant of independence, and that really means that we need to stay stay in our lane and just do those things that Congress assigns us to do. If we're going to roam all over the landscape, then we shouldn't be independent. We should be part of the elected branch uh, of government. So that means we, we stick to our knitting, I would say. We do have, though, uh, we, have, we have tools that can be used in the financial system only in emergency situations, uh, such as the global financial crisis of a decade ago, such as the pandemic. And those, those tools can only be used now with the approval of the Secretary of the Treasury. This is under statute passed by Congress. This is under Dodd-Frank. So we do use those tools and they're very powerful, but they have quite a limited use. And again, only to be used in unusual and ex exigent circumstances with the permission of the Treasury Secretary, who of course is part of the uh, the administration. So I, I think it's it, we need to stress and we try to stress all the time that we have we have tools uh, that we can use, but they're not for general times. Particularly now, what I would say is that the tools that we're using now are lending tools, not spending tools. So we don't have the ability to to make grants of money to particular groups of people, no matter how directly they are affected by or companies affected by the by the pandemic that is that is a job for elected officials who control spending and taxation it's not a job for appointed officials uh, like us so there is a need to to underscore the limits of our powers although our authorities are very strong and at a time like this you're seeing how strong they can be one of the ways to draw a line between lending and spending is you just <clears throat> put it is to um, make, let me say, only loans that will be paid back. Um, you might say with 100% certainty if there was such a thing in the world. Um, that's generally been a dictum of the Fed. You've been directed during the pandemic, not you personally, the Fed has been directed uh, to make loans in places where um, the Fed has not gone before and maybe they're not 100% guaranteed to pay back. Um, do, do you see that as this? I was talking a minute ago about mission creep or mission impossible or something like that. Does that kind of thing worry you? You know, this is a this is a this uh, an emergency of a nature that we haven't really seen before. And at the beginning of this, my colleagues and I really saw that we needed to be using our tools to their fullest extent, that it would be very hard to explain to the public why we would hold back from doing that at a time when we, we saw the, you know, the 50-year low in unemployment turn into an 80, 90-year high in unemployment in the space of 60 days. We saw the economies around the world shutting down. And we, you know, I think we felt called to, to do what we could. And so we, we crossed a lot of red lines 
uh, that that had not been crossed before, and I, I'm very comfortable that this is that situation in which you you do that, and then you figure it out uh, afterward. Um, so that's how that's how I would look at that. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, in line with that, um, as you were called to do a lot of things, the Fed has stood up in a very short period of time a veritable alphabet soup of special lending facilities, some of which look like the uh, what happened in the financial crisis, but many of which look very different from that. Could you just give us a sense institutionally how hard the task that was? You alluded in my first question that you weren't sleeping much in March. And I, <laughs> I can sympathize with that. But could you give us all a, a sense of how different and how difficult it was for the institution? Well, I so I think it is an extraordinary institution. We we are lucky to have uh, a large number of highly de dedicated, highly capable people, many of whom were here and lived through the global financial crisis and were, you know, critical players in implementing uh, the, the facilities that were put in place then, really to prevent the collapse of the global financial system. Very different set of problems, but uh, so so I think. We benefit from from that experience, and all of us, of course, as you have, have studied the lessons of the financial crisis a great deal. So I think, I think we knew a lot. I think so. I, I would break it into a, a series of phases. First, what happened was that as the pandemic, as it became clear, sort of a week or so before the end of February, that the pandemic was going to be a global phenomenon, that any hope that it would be, be contained in a meaningful way in a province of China was gone. And markets began to struggle with processing that. How do they think about, how do they, it's unknowable really, what will be the effect on the global economy? So markets became extremely volatile. Investors fled from any kind of risk and really uh, markets stopped functioning in a, in a broad sense so that companies and households couldn't borrow, couldn't roll over debt and markets kind of closed. So this was, so what we did was we came in in the first instance and we, we, uh, tried to restore market function through a, a variety of ways. We 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 uh, we purchased a lot of treasury securities to get that market working again. Uh, the short-term money markets, which are systemically important uh, to many uh, 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 private uh, corporations, uh, they stopped working. So we, we we did some facilities there. Then we turned to the provision of credit to corporations and to. Uh, uh, municipalities and states. That's something we really had not done in modern history at all, but this is not the global financial crisis. That was about weakness in the financial system. This time the financial system is in good shape relatively. It's got strong capital, much better risk management, high levels of liquidity. This was a problem in, in the real economy, in the private sector of companies not being able to finance themselves. So we, we set up, we announced the setup of a facility to, uh, you know, to backstop that market. And as we backstop these markets, even before we begin actually lending, they start to work again. There's a confidence factor that we've seen uh, in real force here. So it was uh, it was a remarkable time. Um, you know, it's a it's a great honor to serve in these jobs. It, sometimes they're not easy, but uh, we never forget how important it is, and, and and really what an honor it is to have to, to be able to be in a job at this time when you're really needed. Thank you. Let me pursue one particular aspect of that, which I guess is still incipient, or maybe it's just started, you know, better than I, which is these Main Street, so-called Main Street lending programs. I remember when Main Street was first announced, thinking that this was an assignment that pushed the Fed into a place where no Fed had ever been, even more so than the ones that you uh, were just speaking about. Can you comment a bit on the special difficulties the Fed has encountered in standing up these this so-called Main Street lending programs? I'd be glad to. Uh, the Main Street facility is for small and medium-sized companies, companies that don't that aren't large enough uh, or in some way don't have the ability to have access to the capital market. So they don't issue public bonds or public equity meaning that they're, that the way they get their financing in their operations is really through the banking system and, and through non-banks. Uh, so 
we we had we have a facility that deals with companies that have access to the bond market, and there's uh, Congress has done a lot for smaller companies that are under 500 employees with the um, pay, Paycheck Protection Program. So um, this is for the companies that are in the middle, and it is very challenging because it's an extraordinarily diverse space. The credit needs of of different kinds of companies in different industries are extraordinarily diverse. Some of them borrow against assets, some against cash flow, uh, some are much more volatile than others. So it's quite, it's it's quite diverse. And trying to figure out the right credit products for that market is is challenging. In addition, uh, the world of bank credit is a world in which every every um, credit agreement between a borrower and a, and a bank is negotiated. So so each credit agreement is a little bit different. So there, it doesn't have the degree of standardization, for example, that the bond market has, where there are forms of indentures and forms of prospectuses, and it's 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 much more, um, you know, it's much more routine than it is. So it's challenging to get in there, but nonetheless, get in there we will. And we so we're we're days away from uh, making our first loans in Main Street. We have we have three facilities that are part of it. They're meant to reach out to different parts of that broad space. In the meantime, many of those companies are finding that they can borrow from banks. Others are, are waiting for us to get our facility up and running. I, it, it is far and away the, the biggest challenge of any of the 11 facilities that we've set up are the three Main Street facilities. But, um, you know, and I would the last thing I'll say is, as we've shown, uh, we're very willing to learn from experience. We, we put out a term sheet, proposed term sheet. We get we got a couple thousand letters from people on the first Main Street term sheet. We turned that around. We've consulted actively with all different kinds of companies and uh, experts and and we you know we've now released the documents and do expect to start making loans on main street uh in a, in a few days in a few days well congratulations you envisioning these loans to be a million half a million i mean i mean that was me speaking you speak what size loans are we talking about so the, the current structure is that the smallest loans would be about a half a million and the largest ones could be you know over a hundred, and, and that's for the for the larger companies. There, we're 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 working with companies that have as many as fifteen thousand employees uh, and five billion in revenue, and there's no there's no limit on the on the bottom end. So, uh, you know, I can imagine us expanding on either end too. I mean, the, the whole nature of this exercise that that Congress has given us is go find companies that have employees. Really, it's all about creating. Uh, a context in which employees, a climate in which employees will have the best chance to either keep their job or go back to their old job or ultimately find a new job. That is the point of this exercise is, is to, it's all about those 25 million people or so who've been laid off, the ones who may not be laid off, but may, may have ultimately be laid off. So that's what this is about. And so we're looking for companies in any, any, any part of the economy that have employees that are not able to get credit, that would have been able to get credit in 2019. So we're looking back at companies that were in good, solid financial shape before the pandemic. We're trying to find those companies and we're trying to create credit products that work for them. That's the nature of the exercise. Tough job, thank you. Let me finish up before and opening up to questions with one or maybe <clears throat> two more nitty gritty monetary policy questions. You've had all of these before. Um, quite a few European central banks and Japan pushed their overnight interest rates into negative territory uh, quite a while ago, in some cases years ago, and have kept them there. Uh, yet the Fed, uh, even before you were chair, has made it quite clear that it doesn't have any intention of doing that. Can you explain why is this some aspect of American exceptionalism that's not so obvious. Well, just generally, why? Maybe maybe I'll give a little context. So um, the problem of uh, we we set a policy rate, which is the federal funds rate, and we we lower it, of course, when the economy is weak. We raise it when the economy is stronger. Uh, inflation was more often a problem, and we would often raise it. It's it hasn't been a problem in a while, but we'd raise it then to sort of prevent the economy from overheating. Not hasn't been a problem recently. So in the late in the 90s, mid and late 90s, I guess after, just after you were at the Fed, Alan, uh, Japan hit the effective lower bound, hit zero. And the question came to the fore, what do you do now? 
And so right since really then, it's more than 20 years now, uh, central bankers and economists have been working on the problem of what can central banks do when they hit zero? Are they out of, are they out of ammunition? And the answer is no. So during the global financial crisis, the Fed got to zero. And we did two things. One, we, we effectively promised to hold our policy interest rate at zero for a long period of time. That affects short, medium, and long-term interest rates. And that supports economic activity because borrowers borrow all, all across the curve. We also bought, uh, this was what became known as quantitative easing, longer term treasury securities and other fully guaranteed securities guaranteed by the US government in order to lower long term yields. Those are the two principal tools that we use during the financial crisis. <clears throat> we feel that we understand them. We no longer think of them as uh, non standard tools. We think of them as in the toolbox because we are in an era of much lower interest rates. We do expect part of the time to be at the effective lower bound of zero, which we are in fact now. It, so some banks decided in addition to that to, <clears throat> to use negative rates. Uh, we don't think that that's an appropriate tool <clears throat> here in the United States. Uh, I, I would say the, the evidence on whether it actually works is, um, is mixed. Uh, there are clearly some negative side effects uh, as there sometimes are with these things. Uh, and it's, it's just not clear to my colleagues and to me on the uh, Federal Open Market Committee <clears throat> that this is a tool that would be appropriate to deploy <clears throat> here in the United States. If I can push you on that for just like one more, <clears throat> because what's different in the United States compared to, I don't know, pick it, the Eurozone? Well, a, <clears throat> a couple of things. One, um, first, I, I don't see that, <clears throat> I, I see, I, I don't see that the evidence, uh, this isn't really a difference. This is a difference in understanding. And there, there are many central bankers around the world who, who feel this way. The evidence on whether it actually helps uh, is, is pretty ambiguous because one thing it does is it, 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 it interferes with the process of credit intermediation that banks undergo. They take in deposits, they lend it out to the extent uh, the policy rate is negative. You're, 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 crushing down on bank margins and that makes them lend less. And there are other, you know, possible uh, negative effects there. I think, I think the evidence is mixed. It's not, it's not clear either way. We also have, we have institutional arrangements here that would, that would not work with negative rates. I wouldn't say those are decisive things like the money market funds fund industry, which a lot of um, uh, companies of various kinds uh, use to fund themselves and which individuals look upon as, uh, as a place to put their money. Thank you very much. Let me turn to some questions that have come in from uh, people listening. I'll have to, pardon my squinting a little. I'm reading this off my screen with my, I won't even mention my age, it's older than yours, eyes. Um, here's a question that starts with, uh, from Frank Rosen's thanking you for your extraordinary job. And the question is, how sensitive is the Fed to the very difficult time uh, that in particular, the lower end of the economic spectrum is experiencing these days compared to the extraordinary strength in the equity market <clears throat> that Wall Street has seen. Does the, and does that affect policy at all, or is it just a necessary side effect that even if you aren't rooting for it, just happens? Let me say hello to Frank uh, and say that um, uh, we know that I guess everyone is, is affected by the pandemic in a negative way to one degree or another, <clears throat> but the burdens are falling um, very strongly on those who can least afford to bear them. Uh, the unemployed come very largely so far, come very largely from parts of the service economy, which involve dealing with large groups of people in, in, that, are, that are tightly together. So that's restaurants, it's bars, it's travel, it's hotels, uh, it's a lot of places. And many of the many of the jobs that have been lost, at least temporarily, are relatively low-paid service industry jobs. So you can just see that uh, that those are the people that are being laid off who have the least, um, you know, the least financial resources. For example, in our in our shed survey, a survey of household economic decision making, which we released a week or so ago. Uh, it looks like if you if you were someone who made forty thousand dollars or less annually, uh, 
the chances of your being laid off in the last month or so approach 40%. So almost 40% of those people have lost a job if you're making 40, that, that's, that's, so this is falling. Secondly, falling on women to an extraordinary degree. This is falling on women to some extent are in those jobs. And so this is, this, the, it's, there's tremendous inequality in the way the pandemic is affecting our population. Now you ask, does that, does that affect our policy? Uh, um, look, it does affect our policy, you know, it, although essentially part of our mandate is maximum employment. It's maximum employment and stable prices are our monetary policy mandate. So, you know, we're very focused on the full range of, of employment and doing it whatever we can to really, to, as I mentioned earlier, to try to get those people back to work or in a new job. Uh, it, some of those jobs may may take a while to come back. It's important that those people be be protected from from this uh, this event. This is not something that was anybody's fault, really. This was a natural disaster. So it's important that they receive support, and they have received a, a very high degree of support so far. Thank you. Um, this next question comes, I think, from variants from several people, but in particular came first from Gilchrist Berg. Um, and the question is, what if there's another big wave of uh, COVID-19 in the late fall uh, and the Fed is asked to react again? How big a balance sheet can you manage before it gets to be a problem and, a, and one of the problems he uh, uh, asked in the question is inflation or maybe you see other problems uh, but just in general, is there any limit to how big you can make the balance sheet? So let me let me start by saying that um, we're not experts on epidemiology, the spread of uh, pandemics, or anything like that. We talk to experts, and and the main answer they give you is that things are highly uncertain. So uh, we don't we don't know anything that the general public doesn't know. If you're listening to the you know experts. Uh, about how this will go. So there is clearly a risk of that, or a risk of a, of a second outbreak or a second wave. Um, and, you know, that would be challenging. We, we of course, would continue to react. We're, we're not close to any limits that we might have. Uh, I would say uh, we would continue to have some authority to react. But I would worry almost more that a second outbreak would would undermine confidence. I mean, a full return to uh, a full recovery of the economy will really depend on people being confident that it's safe to go out and safe to engage in a broad range of economic activities. That's how the economy will recover. And you see people testing the limits now probably every day. All of us are doing things we might not have done two months ago. And you're just seeing how that works. We're watching the data nationally. So that's what's going on. I think a second wave could be would, would really undermine public confidence and might make for a longer uh, you know, a, a significantly longer uh, uh, recovery and weaker recovery. Uh, in terms of, of the balance sheet, and I, first, in, inflation is, um, the, the, the inflation concerns uh, for now are, are to the downside. The risks are to the downside, not to the upside. Um, we see prices moving down. That's because in a lot of parts of the economy, people are cutting prices. So, so the, you'll see weak inflation data for a while. Um, we've been dealing with disinflationary forces for a long time, actually, globally. We've seen inflation. One thing that's happened since, um, since 1975 is inflation was really the big economic issue, really since another Princetonian, Paul Volcker, one of the great public service servants of, of, our, of our lives, uh, what he did at the Fed and his colleagues did, inflation has really been under control. So it's, it's not ups the upside risk to inflation is not great. I would say, you know, of course, our balance sheet can't go to infinity. I would say that uh, that um, I'm, I'm comfortable with with where we are now and the path that we're on, and don't see risks uh, based on what we're doing right now from inf to, uh, to inflation or to financial stability. Thank you. We have a couple of variants on this question. I'll read the one that came from Roseanne Harford. Uh, it reads. Once the Fed is done purchasing fixed income securities, so it's anticipating going down the road you were talking about a little further, what's the plan for managing the portfolio? I, I, I read the question as saying it'll have more than fixed income or it might have more than fixed income securities in it. 
Well, um, we tend to, um, with, with, the, with the things that wound up on our balance sheet during the financial crisis, we held them to maturity. These are relatively short-term loans of, you know, four years. So far, that's what we've been doing. So the plan would be not to sell them, but to hold them to maturity. I would say we, uh, we do not desire to have an active role in managing the portfolio. Uh, we're not the right ones to, um, w once, the, once the facilities are, have done the lending that they're going to do, then uh, the decisions about what to do, about covenant defaults and things like that will, will, will not be something that we will want to be involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. And those are arrangements that we'll work out. We, of course, have a financial advisor <clears throat> on each of these uh, facilities. And uh, in some way or other, that will be managed in a, in a commercially reasonable way, but not, not by uh, Fed policymakers. Okay, thank you. That's very useful. Uh, there's a generic question from Judy Jang about how would the Fed go about communicating with the public on these emergency tools and in particular in an effort to avoid some of the misunderstandings that took root after the emergency measures of the uh, financial crisis about a decade ago. That, that proved, as you well know, not to be too popular with the public, even though it was tremendously successful. Well, the, the first thing is that we're, we're disclosing, disclosing uh, just a lot of information, much more than the law actually requires us to disclose. We're disclosing for all of the facilities under the CARES Act, we'll be disclosing the name of the borrower, the amount, and we'll be up, updating those in, in a, on a very regular basis. So I, I like to think that you know, disclosure will really help because I mean, I, I read, I read things in the paper that are supposedly happening, and I know they're not happening. I mean, for one one reason they're not happening is we actually haven't made very many loans yet. So I, I read that we're you know we're extending tons of credit to this industry or that. Actually, we we haven't really made a lot of loans in the corporate credit facilities. We haven't started the municipal facility yet. So I think that's the so transparency is really important. I also think we have to just, and we. this is something we've been focused on. I mean, Alan, you were at the very beginning of the transparency revolution and one of its, one of its principal authors. So I, th I think the, you know, the old, the old theory was tell them nothing. You know, there should be a lot of mystery around central banking. Alan and a, and a bunch of other researchers really flipped that completely around. And, and now the view has been for some time that transparency is your friend that markets will do the work for you if they understand what you're doing. So um, we we work very hard to explain ourselves to the general public and, and particularly focused on the general public's uh, elected representatives in Congress. We, we work really hard to stay in communication with them, the ones who are on the committee, the ones in leadership, the ones who are not on the committee, just so, and, and also we, we try to communicate publicly through a lot of outreach so that we explain what we really are doing and try to avoid misunderstanding. And also, by the way, listen to feedback. We listen. You know, we did this um, round of events over the last year, so-called Fed Listens, which was really uh, such a, a successful uh, uh, program where we, we li listen to people from all different walks of American life talk about how they think about the Fed and monetary policy. And I would tell you, it really informed the work we've been doing uh, in, in sort of reviewing the way we do what we do. Just as a footnote to that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy every time you draw the distinction between lending and spending, but a warning, uh, I wrote a whole book on the crisis, as you know. Uh, the public left that with no distinction, <clears throat> thinking that the Federal Reserve had spent all this money and the Treasury had spent all this money, even though virtually every penny of it was lending, not spending. So. This is something that need, I'm not, don't think I have a magic solution to how you explain this to the average American, but it's a huge task. And the, uh, uh, in the case of the financial crisis, they never really got the distinction. So good luck with I, that. I, Alan, I would, I would just say most people have better things to do in their life than to understand the details of central banking. And I think working at the Fed, you, you get that from day one. But our obligation is to be as transparent as possible and to patiently and clearly explain ourselves to the public that we serve. And we just we just work really hard at that. And that's that's part of the job. Uh, 
uh, you know, it's part of how we retain our democratic legitimacy. Thank you. We've got time for a few more questions. I'm, I'm squinting at the screen to try to um, read them. Uh, Michelle Lou Petkoff asks, are the latest Fed, this is a bit related to a previous question, are the latest Fed policies likely to lead to more income inequality in the United States? Absolutely not. And I'll tell you why. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the pandemic is falling on those least able to bear its burdens. It is a, a great increaser of, of inequality. If you just look at the, uh, look at the labor market reports that the B Bureau of Labor Statistics put out, puts out, you will see that it is low paid workers in the service industries who are bearing the brunt of this. It's also women to an extraordinary degree, as I mentioned. So everything we do, everything we do is focused on creating an environment in which those people will have their best chance to keep their job or get a new job, Could maybe go back to their old job if they've been furloughed. Now, how does that work? So take, take, the, um, take a company that, uh, for example, I won't give a name, but just as an example, a company that was investment grade on March 22nd, but that's now been downgraded to so-called junk, a non-investment grade company but that has tens and tens of thousands of employees. Now, why would we include that company in one of our programs? This is a, these are very large companies, and there are many of them that would fit that description. I'm not thinking of any one. Well, the reason is this. If, if a company like that doesn't have market access and can't roll over its debt and can't have enough cash on hand to deal with its obligations, what they're going to do is they're going to lay people off. They're, they're going to cut costs. They won't have any choice. That, that, that is the choice they will make, let's put it that way. So by, by, by announcing our facility and including those companies, the ones who actually need the credit or needed the credit in March, we've, those companies have now been able to go out and finance themselves and have now lots of cash on their balance sheets. And for the most part, have it. These are, these are companies that are not so directly affected as some of those service industry companies are that deal directly with the, you know, with the public in large numbers. Um, they've been able to avoid big layoffs. So, it really is, that is the point of all of this. And it, it um, I, I think we have to keep our focus really tightly on that goal of the labor market and supporting the labor market and not get distracted by, uh, you know, by other other goals. Thank you. I think this <clears throat> will be the last question. It takes us outside the boundaries of the United States. Catherine Rampell asks, as the Fed looks at the global economic situation, what are you thinking about the um, what's happening in both in the pandemic and in the economics in some of the poorer countries in Asia, such as, and she lists India, Pakistan, and Indonesia as examples. So this is this is a very challenging time for those countries. They they don't have the kind of medical infrastructure that we have. Um, they don't have the um, the policy space, as we say. They don't they they don't have um, the ability to provide support to their economy, either through fiscal policy or monetary policy that we do. So it's a it's a very very difficult, challenging time for for many of those poorer countries. And the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are doing you know everything they can to to get more resources and and. Uh, and try to help those countries. But there's no question for all of the suffering that's going on in the countries like the United States, Western Europe, you're seeing uh, um, ev even worse uh, outcomes in, in many of the poorer countries. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's something that, um, you know, that those international organizations are gonna need a lot of support from nations like the United States and have been getting it, uh, you know, to deal with. I have one final question from an extremely important person, very important person. <laughs> Susan Powell asks, and she starts phrasing it, Chairman Powell, you have a favorite child. <laughs> and should that favorite child be congratulated on anything? Uh I love all my children equally, but I certainly think Susan Powell deserves special congratulations here today for graduating the class of uh, the class of 2020. So thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Susan. And all of us here join that. Congratulations, Susan. Uh, the class of 2020 will long remember the end of its senior year uh, and is going to get two graduations, as probably most people on the call don't know, a virtual one happening soon and then another physical one uh, in a year's time. So Chairman Powell, on behalf of the Griswold Center, if I may take the liberty, although I'm not a member, on behalf of the class of 1975, on behalf of the entire Princeton University community and indeed the citizenry of the United States, I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for spending the time with us this morning. We are deeply in your regret, in your debt, and really glad that you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So thank you. Thank you, Al. the citizenry of the United States. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for spending the time with us this morning. We are deeply in your regret, in your debt, and really glad that you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So thank you. Thank you, Al. We are deeply in your regret, in your debt, and really glad that you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So thank you. Thank you, Al. The citizenry of the United States, I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for spending the time with us this morning. We are deeply in your regret in your debt and really glad that you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So thank you. Thank you, Al. The citizenry of the United States, I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for spending the time with us this morning. We are deeply in your regret, in your debt and Really glad that you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So thank you. Thank you, Al.